those three parts, cuff, ribbing, and the heel and the toe are done the same way. So this is kind of a beginner class that um, the biggest thing with these machines is muscle memory, doing the same thing over and over the same way, and then you have less to remember. So I'm using an Erlbacher Basic. This one was made in 2011, it's number eight. Um, this is my go-to favorite, love this machine. Um, I've got lots of machines, but this is the one that I take to all the, the shows and my teaching machine. This is another machine here. This is a 1916 gear art, um, runs great. This is normally my in the house machine and this one is out in the mill. We're gonna do a little uh, mill tour later uh, tomorrow because we had a cancellation. Melissa Ellison Dewey is not gonna be able to show her sock collection because she is a nurse and she's been called into work for the weekend. So um, thank her for what she's doing and wish her the best of luck with that. So I'm gonna cast on with just a, a red onion sack. And they don't make these the way they used to. This one's in kind of rough shape and it's brand new. So I always start with my yarn carrier at my three o'clock mark. And that way I always know where I'm gonna be starting. I'm just gonna drop this down in through and just have it pick up a bunch of the, the latches. You can do the gob web too, which is you know multiple uh, multiple layers of waste yarn. I think it's a waste of yarn. I got a mess going here. Come on. Sorry, my fingers are in the way. They'll get out of the way soon. Yeah. So this is just casting on. It doesn't need to be perfect. So now I'm going to take my waste yarn, which is a thinner. This is just some. Um, crappy Chinese, not crappy because it's Chinese, it's from China. It's a thin yarn, a contrasting color, what I'm gonna make my cast on bonnet out of. So I thread my machine, come down through here, snip the end off with this blade, do the yarn carrier, and I'm gonna bring my yarn right across my red mark at three o'clock. All right, and enough yarn to go across the cylinder, put it down the middle. And with my left hand, I'm gonna reach underneath and grab everything like that and advance slowly. I'm just gonna start picking up stitches and then I can pick up. Now that I've gone forward, I can uh, pick up some more netting on the loose needles. Stick through there. So again, we're just casting on, and I will try it again, because that came right off. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I use a cast on bonnet. I can I can hear him laughing. I think I had too much gobbledygook in there. I got an hour, so. Try that again. Now this yarn I picked up from a flatbed knitter who went out of it. And it's a little thinner than I like, which is why that just happened. If this doesn't work again, I'm gonna change it out. All right, so it's not picking up all the stitches, which is no big deal. Come down here from my little tool and just hang one of these other stitches up on any of the bars and that will start to pick them up. Go a few more rounds. Now it's starting to look like it's casting on. One more there. Oh. 
there it is. I'm cast on now. So now I'll take my buckle and with the whole side up like that, I'm gonna slide this mess into it and then bend the buckle down. And then I can hang my stem weights in the hole and I have even pressure on my knitting. All right. So now I'm gonna change to my project yarn. And I'm gonna, this is some of our Good Karma Farm sock weight yarn. It's 100% wool, it's a three ply. Um, it's twisted, it's spun tightly so that it wears well because I don't like super wash and uh, we don't need to add nylon to it. It wears very well. Um, this is it undyed. We're gonna do some uh, hand painting demonstration tomorrow. Amy's gonna show you how to hand paint your own yarn. Uh, and I'll also show you my cone winder, how I put them on these cones, which is um, a nice way to knit from. You can knit from a ball, you can knit from a cake, you can knit any, any way you want to, but these, these machines don't like a lot of uh, tension on them. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now I've got my waist yarn here. Now I'm gonna cut off, I'm gonna cut my yarn here, get my waist yarn out of the way, bring in my project yarn. Thread the machine again. So what I'm gonna do is, Sean, if you come right down here and look in here, I'm gonna take my waist yarn, go right over my red mark. I'm gonna bring my project yarn, and sorry about my muted talking, because I always put my pick tool in my mouth, which is why you never wanna use my pick tool. So now I'm gonna come through with my project yarn. Get my fat fingers out of the way. I'm gonna go enough yarn to go across the cylinder, and then I'm gonna go back. A couple of needles like that. So now these two are going to hug together for a couple of stitches, which will help it not pull out. Um, I have a counter on my machine, so I'm going to set my counter to zero. Another important thing I always have is a notepad with a pen so I can write down what I'm doing. So if I'm making a pair of socks, I know what my match is going to be. My counter set to zero. My Waste yarn is in, my project yarn is in. So now I'm gonna hold these two together a little bit just so they can't pull out. And I'm gonna advance the machine slowly, make sure everybody's knitting. And now I want them through once. I'm gonna go 10 rows. There's 10 rows, I'm gonna stop back here at three o'clock. All right, so now we're gonna do a Pico hem. That's what this is. This is a Pico hem with the valleys and the Picos stretched out, all right? So that's what you use to hang your bonnet with. And there's lots of people that put metal rings on and that kind of stuff. I don't. Um, I go through a lot of bonnets because I end up cutting the loops off when I go to separate it from, from uh, my sock. Um, I can make one in, in no time at all and it's always good practice. So I'm gonna take my stem weights off. I can leave my buckle on. I'm gonna start over here at my nine o'clock mark. And I'm gonna take this stitch all right, and you just pull it out like that, and I'm gonna transfer it to the next needle closest to it. So there's no, no stitch on there, two stitches on there. I'm gonna go to this one, transfer that one. Uh, transfer the, every other one is gonna have two stitches, and then the other one's gonna have no stitches. And I'm using my left hand to give tension and move things in and out so that it's easier to not split the yarn, um, you know, nothing, Go blank. Meanwhile, going all the way around, and then before long here, I'm going to get to where uh, the needles are, are down. And one of the most important things to remember when knitting with these machines is to have weight on if you're trying to crank. If you don't, it will come undone. So now these guys, I can't reach very well. So with my left hand, I'm going to pull down on the knitting. Advance the yarn carrier out of the way. And again, there are other ways to do this. This is my way of doing it. It's worked very well for me. Um, you know, everybody has their own method. This is a nice, easy one. I'm a self taught knitter. Um, it took me forever to learn how to knit because I taught myself out of a 1920s manual for the auto knitter on a Franken machine that didn't run very well. I didn't know what I didn't know. So I'm just going all the way around. And this is 
I know people that get very frustrated with this. Uh, it's muscle memory. Your fingers need to know what they're doing. All right, I'm back to where it's going to be harder to reach. Pulling down and drop the stitches. Son of a biscuit. When was the last time I dropped a stitch? Are they laughing? Yeah. Amy, I thought I saw a comment about something about for is there something that we need to be doing? No, the employee was saying that there's nothing to do with the reason, but that could be there. It's not because someone else is putting out that they're having a viewing, they can stop their video mm -hmm. and we can't see them. And that will save them on their end. Sure. Yeah. I don't drop stitches, people. Big lights. Somebody just mentioned, thank you for showing us you're human too. <laughs> Come on. Of course, now it was, don't. Don't watch this part? Well, pay no attention to the man behind the mask or whatever they said. Problem is my my main stitch ran all the way down because of this cheap, crappy blue yarn. Oh, yeah, yeah. One yarn. I am. So, this is how you fix drop stitches. You ladder them up. Somebody wants to ask, somebody asked me if that tool is a uh, yeah, it's just a, so the question was asked, is this tool homemade? And yes, it is just a uh, needle with the butt cut off and stuffed into a dowel. So, um, yes, you can make your own tools very easily with this. All right, there's that. Let's continue. Uh, so now I'm still going around. Now, if this was a sock that I was making, I would start over. Um, oh, looks like I'm getting rattled. Come on. Uh, I'm not nervous, it's just <laughs> not working. All right. Get it back. Uh, you're going to feel what it needs to do. And if you do it from the outside, yeah, the question was, do you, what was it again? Is it better to latch with downward pressure or no pressure? You're going to have to feel what it does. If you do it from the outside of the, the knit, then you won't see the repair. If you do it on the inside, you will. I guess that's the pearl side. I am not a knitter myself, other than with these machines. I'm still going around and... All right. So this should be over here. All right. Yes, that shouldn't be there, because that should be over there. There. All right. It's going to be wonderful when it's done. Wow. All right. So now I'm going to set my counter back to zero. And I'm going to do 10 rows. Go nice and slow. Make sure everybody's knitting. And left, these are the picos here. Ten rows, and I'm going to stop at three o'clock again. Now we're going to hang the cuff. And this is going to be interesting the way I screwed that up earlier. So what I do is I'm going to reach down in here and I'm going to roll this up so I can see. I'm going to roll it up and I'm going to spread my fingers wide like this. So now I can see my first row of project yarn and my last row of waste yarn. All right. So I want to take this stitch right here. This is my first row of project yarn and I'm going to hang it on the corresponding bar up above it the needle up above it. I'm going to go, I like to get four or five of these right in a row. Yep, no problem. 
So this is hanging the cuff. This will knit these together and then the blue yarn will peel out. And that if I get, you know, five or six of them or as many as I can get easily, I know that my cuff is gonna be straight. All right, so now I've got those hung. So now I can kind of go anywhere I want to. And I always try to go in order. This is about the only place that I don't. I really don't like this blue yarn. Holy cow. I have not used it. It's a little late now. It will work because I'll be past this point here in a minute. All right, so I'm just hanging the first row of project yarn on top of the corresponding needle. And roll it up a little further. And this is where your, this is where your pick tool really comes in, that you want to have a good one that you can reach in and grab all those stitches. Amy, is the video showing up clear? Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm going to go back here until I can't reach any more needles. Tell me if my fat fingers are in the way. No, nope, you're good. So actually, this yarn carrier right now can weep back just a little bit without doing any damage. I'm not going backwards. Just gives me a little bit more room. And this will knit this cuff together. Now this is different than a selvage edge if you're using the river, which I'm not a, a fan of. Only what? Uh, I think um, Jamie at csmsupplies.com, I, I believe that's the name of her website. Jamie Mayfield sells them in Missouri. Uh, the pick tools, I'm sorry. I can hear Amy talking to me and she's asking me the questions that you guys are sending. Um, but Jamie Mayfield uh, at CSM Supplies, I will double check that email. She'll be speaking later on too, so she can uh, plug that. But she sells those kind of things. All right, so now. Okay, I don't understand the question. Say it again. Wait. Unmute. Oh. Um, somebody's asked the question, when you advance the yarn so you can get to the needles, the low needles, is it knitting, giving you stitches beyond your three o'clock? That's the question. When, when you, when you weep the yarn carrier back? Is that what they? No, it's when you, when you're advancing, is it knitting? Yeah. Yeah. So right now, right now I'm as far as I can go on here because that needle's down. So now I'm going to come back over here and start working this way. I usually try to work in the direction that the, that the yarn is going. So I try to work everything this way. And there's, there's less to remember. So just grabbing just the stitch. This, when I first started, I used the, uh, the metal cast on baskets and I hated them. I still call them dead spiders. So here's where I got that funky part where I dropped the stitch. Let's see what happens here. That one goes there. I may have to go a couple different directions here to get this. So that's gonna go there. I'm gonna move to the far side of you, Jim. Okay. It will be. That one. And I want that one. All right, we're all good. We got by that mess, I think. Get a counter, tractor supply, get a bail counter.
And normally for waste yarn, I like white because of most of our yarn, we hand paint all of our yarn. Um, so it usually works, but it, it's really hard to see with this gray. So I didn't think I'd be doing anybody any favors. So what I'm gonna do now is gonna pull down, make sure that someone is gonna catch. Oh, nice. And again, you want to make sure you pull down or it's going to come undone. And I'm going to be off by one somewhere. I'm going to go there and I want to go double that one up. Again, this is a cast on bonnet. It's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. So it should be. All right. Oops. Don't need that blue one in there. Yeah. All right. So we're all the way around. So this yarn is, I'm blaming it, but it's my fault too. So what I'm gonna do is just gonna hold down on this for a second. I'm gonna pull down. I'm just gonna go one, two, three. Now we're gonna do the mock rib. So this is the mock rib here. You can see the, the well, maybe you can see this better. This is one of my socks, my finished socks that I make. And this is the mock ribbing here. Hang on there. Yep. And this is a, um, a 60 cylinder. So I do a three by one mock rib. So again, coming over here to nine o'clock, see if I can't drop some stitches over here again. I'm going to take, transfer that stitch. I'm going to take that needle right out. Then I'm going to go one, two, three, and the fourth one, I'm going to take and transfer that stitch, take that needle out. So this is a three by one mock rib. One, two, three, take the next one out. I was doing two by one mock rib, and then if I did three by one, I had less hand work at the end. So again, I'm just taking out each needle. I like to, I'm not a very organized person, believe it or not. <laughs> but I, when I'm knitting, I like everything where it's supposed to be. My weights are here, my weights are here, my scissors are here. So I always put my needles in one spot so I know how many of them I have out and that they're all going back in and I don't lose them. So again, I'm back down to where it's gonna be hard to reach them. So I pull down on your knitting, advance the machine forward, and then back here. So one, two, three, fourth needle. Take the needle out. So again, this is great practice if you're just starting because you're gonna need a cast on bonnet and you're gonna end up beating it up, or I do anyway. So it's a good way to practice. You can do your foot size. It. Well, you can't really do foot size. It. Amy, I thought I saw a question just now about mock revving. Why do you do it? So I'll repeat it. Oh, well, I guess it's good. Never mind. Uh, Jim, the question was asked, why, why are you doing a mock rib? Why not just crank with all the needles in? Well, stocking that is going to be a lot looser fit, where this is with the, the ribbing that you can see it gives it some stretch to the, to the leg. So it's going to stay up better. Um, just a straight stocking net is going to be a baggy, unformed sock. And this looks like regular ribbing without having to deal with the river. Because most of the knitting that I do, I'm either at a farmer's market, we're at a show, I'm demonstrating. So you can't see anything with river on there. And, you know, you rib and then you take it off and you find out you dropped a stitch and then they swear in public and people get upset at me. So I don't, I just don't like the river. Um, I can do it. I just find this to be easier. Um, and it's kind of, I've made my own type of sock that is a little different than everybody's. 
because it's a practice. Um, you don't have to. Oh, uh, the question was um, why the mock rib on a bonnet. And you don't have to at all. There's lots of ways to make bonnets. I prefer it this way just because it's practice. You know, you can do straight stocking net. You can do a drawstring closure. I do a toe just because it's, it's good practice. It's, it's all the elements of a sock without having to make a match. Um, I think they just look better. You know, it's a nice little, this is not our yarn either. This is some yarn that we got from um, Classic Elite when they went out of business. It's some kind of weird chain yarn. Um, but it's rugged, so it holds up to my stuff better. And I don't usually use fishing line or anything like that. Um, I'm lazy, I guess. I just use what I've got and make that. So back here, almost done. All right. So it came out even. Um, the question was asked, do you always transfer stitch to adjacent needle in the direction of knitting? Does it matter? I don't think it will matter. Um, I do it just because I think, the, well, sorry. The question is asked, do you always transfer to the adjacent needle or can you go either way and does it matter? I always try to work in the direction that the yarn is going because you, you might not have a thick spot or a thin spot. I don't know. Um, I don't think it will matter at all. I just, I, I think that muscle memory is the most important thing with these machines of doing the same thing, the same way every time. That's why I always start and stop in the same spots. You can do it anywhere on here, but I don't have as much to remember. Um, so now we're through the cuff right here and we've done our three stitches there. And now we're, we're right at the top of the mock grip right here. So for my lady socks, I will generally make, this is a uh, lady sock here. So this is 50 rows of mock ribbon. In my men's socks, I do 60 rows. So we're gonna do 50 rows. What we're gonna do first is put my weights back on. My weights are on. I'm gonna zero my counter out and I'm gonna advance it four stitch, four rows one two three four and that's because we did the first three rows to get underneath the cuff and then one row of going around doing the mock rib um you know you won't really see a couple of rows but it just that's how the formula works so my my pattern that i would write for this my cuff I'm getting a little out of sync here but my cuff i put this little kicker on it that's my little signature detail and so I do that the same way every time. But if I was to do, the, I usually write, all right, cuff, whatever I'm making for my cuff. And now I'm gonna do 50 rows of mock ribbing. And then I'm gonna do 50, 60, because I'm gonna do 50 rows of mock ribbing and then 10 rows of free heel. So here we go with the mock ribbing. I'll do a visual check, make sure all my latches are open. I'm seeing a lot of people as I'm teaching now are starting to do this with the needles, but these latches are designed to open and close. So if you flick them like that, you're gonna close them. And a closed, a closed latch is a drop stitch. All right, so just check with your eyes. And if there's one, then just lower it down. Um, I don't have any here. My needles are not sticky. So, um, and as far as tension goes, you know, you should do your gauge. I know what my gauge is for my yarn and I really only knit with my yarn, so I'm not a great one to talk about gauge, but I like 10 rows to the inch with my yarn. Um, that gives me the fabric that I like. You know, it's a nice comfortable fabric. It's got stretch to it. Um, that's what I like. So I'm set up to do that. So I'm at four right now, and we're gonna do 50. And I'm a bit of a left-hand knitter too, where I'll just kind of, I won't pull down with this, but I'll just keep weight on it. Um, I go slow the first time, just in case you do drop a stitch, you can catch it with your, your finger on the sidewall so it doesn't run. Um, my yarn won't run, this blue stuff does. <laughs> so, I'm good to go, so just crank right along. And you don't have to crank super fast, you know, just be steady with it.
48, 49, and at 49, I'll stop here at nine o'clock and then I'll start putting my needles back in. So I go to the first one that I can reach, put my needle back in, and now I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna take this stitch right here and drag it up over the top and it will make this little figure eight. All right, so on the sock, um, that's right here. You can kind of see it, but not really. If you don't do it, it's gonna leave a gap. It's not a hole, it's not gonna run, but as you know, some people call it a design element, it looks like a mistake to me. So I'm gonna, now I'm just gonna keep going, put a needle in, hang the bars and I, I hang the bar as I go that way I don't forget I could go around and put all my needles in and not worry about it but if I do it one at a time I know I haven't missed one I'm grabbing that stitch dragging it across And this is another muscle memory one. And you know you're getting proficient at it when you don't have to stand up to do it anymore. All right, just a little trickier around the yarn mast. All right, so now I'm back to where the needles are down. I have my weights on. I can just advance the machine forward. Look at that, right amount of needles, right amount of... All right, so there, I'm done there. Now, I'll go around one time. Now I'm at my 50 rows. I'm gonna do 10 rows of pre-heel. There's 59. So when I come around this time, I'm gonna stop down here, right between my two heel marks. Um, I call it six o'clock because we're going we're gonna to have to raise these needles out of work to turn a heel. All right. So now I'm going to take my crescent tool, raise all these needles from three o'clock to nine o'clock out of work. So that's called out of work. You don't have to worry about weights on them. They're not doing anything. They're out of work. So another way to muscle memory this is as I turn my heel, I'm going to crank by until it stops clicking over here. You can look, Sean. This is an uplift cam. This is what's making all the noise. There's one on the other side too, which is the leading edge, which we'll catch on the way back. But that's riding on the needle butts, making that clicking noise, all right? So that has to be clear, the last needle butt, to be able to come backwards. Because this one here is the leading edge. So this is going under, lifting the needles up, actually. So it stop clicking. I'll go just a little bit past that. I'm gonna raise this needle up out of work. And I'm going to come up here and put my heel spring on. Where is this? Get up there. So I'm going to put my heel spring right in front there. So what this does is the heel spring lifts up and pinches the yarn against this block, which is allows you to go forward and backwards. If I tried to do this, if I take this off, and I try to go backwards, there's no tension down here, and it will just make a loop. You can do it by hand. It's uh, less than desirable. So I'll put this back on. So now I can go forward and backwards. So now as I come back this way, you can see this is my leading edge. It's going underneath, lifting those needles up. And this one's making all the racket in the back. Now that's clear. I'm gonna raise this needle out of work. Okay, and what you do on one side, you have to do on the other side to make it come out. 15 minutes, all right, good. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep doing that, raising them, raising them up out of work. I'm doing a decrease. So I'm gonna decrease to my target marks down here. So there's math involved without numbers. So again, being a left-hand knitter, trying to hold on to it. Now I'm gonna pull up. 
And we're not knitting round now, so it's gonna, it's, the knitting is gonna eventually start riding up. So using heel forks, you can stop that. And you see that there, that's not knitting round anymore. So always do your needles before you're gonna do anything else. So if you're either raising them or lowering them, do that before you put in your weights or anything like oh, that. Oh, hang on, sorry. Uh, what happened? Right, I got a, or somebody was trying to call me, so it, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. I know. So where, where, did we get that? Uh, yeah, I think okay. so. So we're not knitting around. So now you're gonna use your heel forks, all right? This is how I like them. Other people like, uh, Soft weights, other people like V hooks. You know, there's lots of ways to do it. This is my way I do it. So I'm gonna put my first one in the middle. You can come right up and look down in the middle. I wanna be about two inches from the top, right in the middle of the needles that are out of work. I'm gonna let that drop. You can see how that pulls the knitting straight down. So my next one, I'm gonna divide the space up between the middle weight and the last needle out of work. Put it like there. And I'm gonna do the same on this side. And it, when you're first beginning, it's no big deal to move your weights. You know, it's easier to move your weights than to have them not be in the right place and not work. So now I can just continue on doing my decrease. And now is when I, I'll kind of just hold the three weights. I'm not pulling down on them. Heading towards my target marks. All right, so my weights are kind of a little bit low now. So I'll take my middle weight and bring that one up first, about the same place it was before, and do the same with the other two. But if you move your middle one first, you'll never have a problem, theoretically. All right, so I'm close to my marks. So I'm in my mark on my right-hand side, which is good. I'm in my mark on my left-hand side, which is better because that means my heel came out even. All right, so now we're to the point where we have to do the increase. And you want to finish on the left-hand side because you're going to end up, uh, you'll be going backwards otherwise. So we're, we finished on the left-hand side. Now we're going to do the increase. So what we're going to do, is we're not doing anything different. We're just going to crank by until it stops, stops clicking. And now I'm going to put two needles down. I'm gonna put the yarn behind it and make sure all my latches are open. This is only when you're doing your increase that you're gonna start with two. So two needles down, yarn is behind them and latches are open. So now I can come back this way. On the first one, I wanna make sure that that's gonna catch, which it is, come back here. Okay, now it's gonna be two needles down, yarn behind. See that latch is closed, latches open. A closed latch is a drop stitch. And now we're going back this way again. Like I say, what you do on one side, you have to do on the other side. So we did two on this round. Now we're going to do one. So needle down, yarn behind, latch is open. Needle down, yarn behind, latch is open. You'll be saying that in your sleep tonight. Needle down, yarn behind, latch is open. Now I want to move my weights because I got this little pocket that's forming right here. So if I move my weight up, I'll take care of that. And this one's going to kind of come up and in. Same on this side. And now I know I did my needle. I don't have to worry about it. Now I'm just going back again. Needle down, yarn behind, latch is open. Needle down, yarn behind, latch is open. And I'm just going back now to my nine o'clock and three o'clock marks. Needle down, yarn behind it, latch is open. And there are lots of different heels. We have somebody that's gonna be speaking about um, different heel flaps a little later on in the schedule. I used to do the one down, two up, or two down, one up method, and I find this is easier. Again, I'm lazy. Needle down, yarn behind, latch is up. We're on the home stretch. Needle down, yarn behind, latch is open. So now I'm at my mark where I started from at the beginning here at the three o'clock. 
So I have my needle is down, the yarn's behind, the latch is open. And I do the same thing over here. And this is how we started when we started the heel that we raised these needles up and did our decrease. So now I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna stop right at six o'clock. Now I'm gonna put all these needles down. And this is where people make the mistake of, all right, I turned the heel, it went great, everything's wonderful. And then they slam down these needles, got lashes closed on the back backside, you drop all the stitches. So as many socks as I've made, I still, to this day, do two at a time. I pinch them. I try and get my finger up inside of the hook so you can feel if the, the latch is open or not. Just down, two at a time. My finger's actually bottoming out on the top of the cylinder, which gives me plenty of height to get the, they're down far enough to pick up the knitting. And if you go too far, you know, you can, uh, you can close your latches or get them halfway like that. That would be a drop stitch right there. So again, two at a time, push down, push down, make sure the latch is open. Once they're all down, here's the hole in the corner that everybody talks about. And there's different ways of filling it. This is the way I do it. There's a double stitch right here. And I take a little of the weight off of my left hand. And I grab that stitch and I carry it over to there. I do the same on this side, double stitch in front. And that, that hole is gone. There's other ways of doing it. That's my way. All right, so now this, this is done. So what I'll do is I take my, heels, my uh, heel spring off because I would be at a heel right now and then I would do the foot and then go to the toe. Am I holding the bonnet below? Well, I have my, the question is, do I hold the bonnet um, while I'm doing the heel? I have my stem weights on and I have my heel weights on. So I don't really have to hold on to the bonnet. Um, normally I would have taken this and I would have raised my, my buckle up quite a bit earlier and had it up over this, over my cuff, like that. So then there's no risk of it falling off and hitting you in the toe either. So we're done. And I took my heel spring off because if you were gonna do the foot and you left your heel spring on, that's gonna change your tension. So now I'm gonna crank over here to three o'clock again, so that my, the hole on my yarn carrier is right over my red mark at three o'clock. I'm gonna come up here and cut my yarn off way back here. And that, that's what I'm gonna to use to Kishner my toe closed. So now I'll take this yarn and drag it in over the middle. Just stuff that down inside, and I'm going to use this yarn instead of the crappy blue yarn that's not going to break on me. So we're just doing the opposite of when we started. Of we had our project yarn, now we're putting waste yarn in that will keep the stitches live until I get a chance to kitchen them closed. And you don't worry about the tension of what your waste yarn is because you don't really care. I like it to be a little thinner than my project yarn. Just because doing the kitchen, it makes your life a little bit better. Same thing again, enough yarn to go across the cylinder and then back it up a couple of stitches so they're going to hug together. Just like that. They're gonna, those two stitches are going to knit together and that will keep it from pulling out. So again, I'll do a visual before I start again, make sure all my latches everywhere are open. They are. So now I'll just hold these two together, go nice and slow the first time, make sure everybody's going to knit. Lovely. And now just try. You don't want to do so many rows that it's hard to do the kitchener with. And Deb Oswald's going to do a uh, tutorial on the kitchener tomorrow. So, so that's about as much as that. One more time. And that won't unravel on me while I do it. So now I cut my yarn off here. Get that up out of the way. And I'm going to reach down here and I'm going to grab everything sock, weights. Uh, heel weights, everything, and just hold it. I don't want to pull up. I don't want to pull down. I'm just going to kind of hold it. I'm resting my arm on my knee, and I'm just going to crank forward, and it'll all come off, and that's casting off. And there you go. So now, get my buckle off of it. Get that off. And I always pull my weights up because when you drop them, they stick really well into your hand. <clears throat> Ask me how I know that one. Those are out of the way. The buckle's off, so now I can cut this off. And you, there's the tail here when we first started. You can kind of see it here in this blue. We don't want to cut that because we're going to use weave that in at the end. 
So this is why I go through so many bonnets because I end up cutting the loops off when I do this. So I'm just trimming off this waste yarn. Some people reuse their waste yarn, I don't. So there's that tail, pull that out, throw that in the junk. So this will all pull out now, this blue, because the cuff is knit together. Two hundred and forty-five. So that's where my drop stitch was. Yeah, you can't really see it. Uh, again, I would fix it. I would have. I wouldn't have gone forward with it if I wasn't live. <laughs> so that all pulls out. So now, there's your, here's your pico edge right there. So this. These loops, the valleys in between the picots are what we're going to pull out. If I can find one. Just like that. So when you... Oh, a little close. My bad. So now if I was going to cast this on, I would bring this over to 3 o'clock, loop it back, and then I would take and grab one of the picots, put it on the next pico, put it on. And this now is every other needle gets a pico because we transferred every other stitch. So that's, this is what it will look like. Uh -oh. Come on. I wouldn't have it on here with this waist yarn. So that's what it will look like. So what I would do is I would cast all the way on with a couple of rows of waist yarn and leave my weights on it. And then that will stretch these picos out so you can see them. But we also can come back here and this is my toe. So this is what would be Kitchenered to close it up. And then that's what your finished bonnet will look like. And the Kitchener is just weaving the, uh, the toe closed. And that's what all that yarn there is for. Yeah. Um, I like to use a lighter colored yarn for this just because it's easier to see. And I guess that's it. <laughs>